It turns out that there are 85,000 elective operations done every weekday in the United States. That's not including emergency work at night or on weekends or on holidays. And this adds up to, to 20 million elective procedures done per year in, the, in this country. And as somebody has put this all together and said that statistically that means that every member of the population, every man, woman, and child in the entire United States will have 12 procedures during his or her lifetime. It's, it's not trivial. We find um, examples in papyrus, old papyrus scrolls in ancient India in 2000 BC or 1000 BC. We find descriptions of operations, the Greeks and the Romans in their writing, we find descriptions of operations and so on. But interestingly, surgery as we know it was done by itinerant practitioners, didn't know anything, they, they, uh, and this happened throughout the millennia until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, they, people would do operations on patients, desperate patients, last ditch patients. Uh, they, the patients would be held down by rather burly attendants while, while the, the procedure went on. It was, it was torture, it was horrible. And if they didn't die during the operation, they died, died a week or two later of, of infections. Well, there were two revolutions that occurred in the middle of the 19th century, uh, which really brought us into the modern age of surgery, of, of what we now assume and expect to be technically perfect. One was anesthesia, of course, in 18, 1848, um, which, which again um, took surgery from, from, a, from a torture chamber into, into a, a, a calm, dissection of tissue in, in, in an asleep patient. And the second, about two decades later, was the idea that you could, you could reduce or, or inhibit infections that often occurred after surgery uh, with, with cleanliness, with asepsis, uh, keeping the area around the incision clean, and then a little later antisepsis, keeping the whole operating room clean, including the, including the surgeons. In my own field of transplantation, for instance, well, I should say that, 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 surgery, that surgery and applied research have, have been, always been very close. Um, in, my own, uh, in my own field of transplantation, for instance, um, the <clears throat> scientists basically started the idea, although the idea has been around for, forever to, to transplant organs and tissues. Um, Scientists really started the idea by showing that, that uh, grafts from the same animal will grow in the, in the normally grafts from a different animal of the same species will, will look fine for a week and then, and then uh, reject. And grafts from an animal of a different species will reject within minutes. And that, that was a new concept which occurred only during or toward the end of World War II. Well, a few people uh, and that this was done in, in small animals. And it turned out that uh, some of the surgeons really began to think about this. And so the original successful transplant, kidney transplant, was uh, between identical twins where there's no genetic barrier. A few people in the, in the uh, 30s and 20s had, had tried to transplant kidneys, for instance, uh, between, between uh, of uh, strangers, or even between animals and, and patients, it would have been a total disaster. But the identical twin transplant was, was brilliant, and it worked beautifully, and it showed, it opened up the whole field, and it showed that it could be done. And then, then the concept of immunosuppression came in, so that increasingly and gradually over decades, over the following decades, uh, we, we were able to transplant uh, organs from, from uh, genetic strangers. Well, this, is, this has gone a long way now. It, it started out with kidneys, uh, it then went to livers and hearts and, and other organs, and now we're transplanting hands, uh, we're transplanting faces. I mean, this is extraordinary stuff for us.